Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sorry, I have stuff on my screen. I'm going to start that again. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sierra Parigi. I am the program coordinator for Project Interface. And today we are joined with uh, Aaron Fisher, uh, Katie Gordon, and Todd Fenton. Um, and they work for Grand Valley State University and the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. They did a wonderful Ravel and Ravel video campaign, and we are here to learn a little bit more about their experience, any tips and suggestions that they have. If you're not aware of Ravel and Ravel.com, it is a multimedia website of over 1,000 video interviews of people discussing their religious or spiritual identity, stereotypes, and how welcoming they found their communities to be. Um, and a Ravel and Ravel video campaign is a tool that we have for community members to go out and collect video interviews in their own communities. Um, so you get your own Ravel and Ravel page. So we will link with this video uh, the GVSU Kaufman Institute campaign that we'll be discussing today. So you can check out their campaign. It was just a fantastic one, and we think it's a great example for people to follow. Um, so with that, I would like to Aaron and Todd a moment to introduce themselves. I'll start with Aaron. Um, Aaron, could you please tell us um, about your position and the organization at which you're at? Sure. So I'm Erin Fisher. Hi, everyone. I coordinate events and exhibits for the university libraries here at Grand Valley State University. And I also oversee the creation of this media alcove space that we have within the library called the Learning Alcove. And more specifically, um, as part of this work, I'm kind of constantly working with folks across campus to build partnerships in order to create innovative new programs and exhibits. Oh, great. And Katie, could you tell us a little bit more about being at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute? Yeah, so I'm Katie Gordon, and I work at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute at Grand Valley State University. Um, it's a nonprofit, it's a community nonprofit that's housed within the university. So we work both on campus and in the community. And um, as the program manager, I do a lot of the logistical planning for events and then also um, help determine future programming. All right, and Todd. Um, so I am a creative assistant at Grand Valley State University. So I actually need, I work for Aaron. Um, and we, yeah, like she said, we oversee a lot of um, uh, content production. So, uh, for example, we're working on an interfaith um, video series called Faith and Culture, where we go out into the community and examine um, different, uh, we have different faith communities in, you know, within the larger Grand Valley uh, community. So we, uh, you know, we, it's, it's, it's all about, like, integrating um our university culture with um, the larger West Michigan. I'm going to start with um, Katie. Katie, could you please tell us a little bit more about the environment at GVSU and the interfaith, both with the Kaufman Institute and beyond? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Grand Valley is a really interesting, different culture than I think um, than I was used to, I guess, for, as far as colleges go. Um, I came from a smaller liberal arts college, um, and Grand Valley is a pretty big community, um, and the student body is pretty diverse, too. Um, but at the same time, because of the area that we live in, in West Michigan, and it's kind of considered the Bible Belt of Michigan, um, there's a reputation for it being a really conservative, Christian, and kind of Calvinist area. Um, so, a lot of the interfaith efforts that have been going on over the years come from the faith-based groups. So it comes from um, the Muslim Student Association planning an interfaith, the student organization planning an event, and then a couple of the Christian organizations here and there. Um, so, I think that the personal religious identity for people is, is really especially important at Grand Valley. Um, so, that's kind of why I was first attracted to Ravel and Ravel is because it embraces the individual's identity and uses that as kind of like the foundation for engaging with other people of different identities. Um, I thought that that was probably something that Grand Valley students would jump on the opportunity to talk about their own background because I think that's something that's really core to, to who they are in this area. So. Um, and, he and actually, so... 
Go ahead. Well, there was um, there was one student who did a Rebel and Rebel video, and I thought he um, kind of uh, summed up this idea really well. Um, he was just walking by, and I don't think he knew anything about Rebel and Rebel, but he came in and did, was talking about it afterwards, and he was like, no, it's cool. I mean, it's basically just like you're being totally unashamed of who you are. And we're like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the idea. You can't be ashamed of who you are. So. It's fantastic. Um. And Katie, how did you first hear about Ravel and Ravel and the campaigns, and what made you want to start a campaign at Grand Valley State? I heard about it, I think, through the Interfaith Youth Corps Alumni Network when it was an idea, and before the website was even up, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but then I didn't actually experience or know more about it until um, the President's Challenge conference in D.C. at Georgetown last year where I got to do um, my own video and be a part of the process and kind of see, like, oh, yeah, this would be a really easy thing to do on my own campus. Um, and I was still new to Grand Valley at the time, so, and I'm just finishing up my first year at Grand Valley, and I thought this would be a really cool way of me getting to know the community, like, by, like, one person at a time, getting to know them. So. Fantastic. Um, and Erin, we're going to move uh, with this campaign. Um, and then I'm going to shoot it over to Todd as well. I want to know how each of you got involved and what role did each of you play? So my answer to this question is actually a really great segue from what Katie was just talking about. So I mentioned when I told you all what I did that I build partnerships across the university in order to create events and exhibits. Well, and then Todd mentioned that we were doing other interfaith work before hooking up with Kaufman. And specifically through this series called Faith and Culture, where we were filming different religious um, celebrations for different faith traditions. And the first video that we did was of the Hindu festival of Diwali last fall. And I went to, because of that work that we were doing, I went to an interfaith event. And it was at that event that I just happened to sit at a table with Katie. <laughs> and she and I started chatting about what we did, and we found out that we actually both, both worked for Grand Valley. <laughs> and I told her we made videos. And she said, oh, really? There's this project called Ravel Unravel. And maybe we could, you know, work together to make this a possibility. And she told me more about it, and immediately I told her this would be an amazing opportunity. And I would totally... Um, I would totally be on board with working together to make it happen. So that was how I initially got involved. But then one of the other things that I wanted to mention is that there were kind of more strategic reasons that it made sense for the library to get involved. And I think this is something that people might not really connect the library with an interfaith organization on campus initially. But one of the library's goals is to uh, to invite interaction and kind of cultivate critical thinking skills, engage students across disciplines, and in generally enrich the intellectual life of the student body. And I think that Ravel and Ravel does all of those things really, really well. And that was the reason why I actually get support, at least for me and my organization, and move forward with dedicating resources to doing a Ravel and Ravel campaign. Fantastic. And Todd, how about you? Um, so, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I work in tandem with Aaron. Um, so, but we saw it. We saw it as a really great opportunity to um, to reach out even more to the interface community. So, what we've been doing um, specifically with faith and culture is, you know, we've been reaching out to community members and getting them to share their faith. Um, but with Ravel and Ravel, we saw the opportunity to. Um, tap more into the student body and maybe, you know, a little bit of the faculty body as well. Um, so specifically what I did is uh, Sean, my coworker, and myself, we we set up the interviews. Um, you know, we made a backdrop and all, you know, all that good stuff. But we, yeah, we recorded and compiled and, and then I edited and actually put the, the all of the clips together and then uploaded them. So... I was the, you know, the technical aspect of it, I guess. Um, and I will say that um, if you haven't checked out this campaign yet, um, Todd did a great job because the videos are beautiful. So we've gotten a lot of compliments on your guys' campaign. Um, 
goals going into this campaign? Well, um, kind of like I mentioned before, religion is a isn't often discussed in depth, especially on a campus, but I think that the students, it's such an important part of their lives, we wanted to bring that out, and we wanted to kind of embrace the role um, that someone's faith or non-faith background just plays in their daily lives, um, and as a larger aspect of um, representing the community. So um, I think that was one goal, is that we just wanted to provide a platform for people to support in um, or what we viewed as important, and what I think it turns out a lot of other people view as important too, um, the role that religion or faith plays in your life. And then um, we also, um, we kept on hearing um, this perspective of people on campus who think that Grand Valley is very homogenous, and, and we, you know, doing interfaith, that wasn't the experience that we were getting. And so we wanted, um, we wanted to kind of respond to that by um, having a platform where the diversity of Grand Valley was able to be shown and really embraced. Um, because I think that, you know, when, when people on a campus or in a community make statements like, well, diversity just doesn't exist here. There, just, mm -hmm. there, aren't, there aren't diverse communities in our area. I think that really erases the experience of the diverse students that are there. And even the ones that are in... Um, the majority tradition like Christianity, but maybe don't feel that they're represented well by other, um, maybe louder people um, or people with louder presence, uh, presences on the campus. So we really wanted it to be an outlet where um, minority perspectives on campus could be heard. And, um, you know, I think that one of the coolest things that we got out of it was that a lot of the secular people um, were really excited to share their stories because that's something in Grand Rapids and in West Michigan that's historically been a pretty big divide between religious people and secular people. And so having the chance for um, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, whatever, um, share that they also have a worldview and it's also really important to them, I think it kind of broke down a lot of the barriers and assumptions and stereotypes against them. Fantastic. Thing to add to that? I do. It's really interesting the way that Kaufman and the library came together and this project benefited both of us tremendously, but actually in very, very different ways. So one of the things that a goal of mine specifically for the project, or and also one of the things that attracted me to it initially, is I wanted to be able to break down this role between a producer of content and a consumer of content. So typically videos that we're creating are just made to be consumed by our students when passing through this media alcove space that we have or if they watch our videos on online. But this allowed us to kind of to make videos as an end product, but to also engage students in the conversation. So the other way that this aligns with larger library goals is that we recently opened a new building the Mary Adam Pugh Library and Learning Information Commons. And one of the unofficial taglines of that space is that it's a space for students by students. So we really try in all of our services and all of our programs to really keep students at the heart of what we're doing. And Ravel and Ravel actually allowed us to do that specifically with you know fostering interfaith dialogue, but to have students' voices be heard and evenly represented. And then another thing that actually was a goal of mine is that although videos were kind of the end product, I saw this more as a week-long event. And in all of the events that we do, we try to really make sure that we're bringing in events into the library that foster opportunities for growth and learning and for dialogue. And again, in a very unique way, Ravel and Ravel allowed us to do that. Great. Goals and how this campaign got started. Um, I want to go a little bit of it, but um, in the meantime, just a quick reminder, if anyone out there has any questions they'd like to tweet at us, and I realize this is backwards, uh, at projectinterfaith.org. So give us a shout out if you have a question. We'll have some time for questions afterwards as well. 
Um, but Todd, I would like to talk to you about how you structured the collection of video interviews. What did that look like? Um, and what suggestion would you have for campuses and organizations that don't really have the capacity to hire a videographer um, to do their campaign? Um, well, actually, I'm really glad you asked that because I am not a professional videographer. I'm a student at Grand Valley. Um, I just work for Aaron. So this is, this is a really good opportunity to, to, to point out that you don't need to have professional people. I think what's most important, especially with Rebel and Rebel, a, a campaign like Rebel and Rebel, is that it needs to be a conversation. So if you're not talking to other people on campus, you're not doing it right. So as far as like, uh, you know, we, we worked uh, obviously very closely with Kaufman and we worked with uh, the religious studies department. And, you know, if you don't have access to, you know, like, so I work for Aaron, but if you didn't have, you know, somebody on hand like myself, you should be talking to your, you know, your, your film students, you should be talking to your broadcast students there. This is a great opportunity to reach out um, to the rest of your campus community. Now, if you don't have that, um, there are just a couple of technical things I guess you could do to, um, I guess, improve the quality of, of, of what you're putting out. So um, as far as just ambiance, we wanted to, I think it was really important for us, you know, there was one day where we couldn't achieve it, but we wanted to make these videos, um, at least in the background, as similar as possible to sort of, um, to sort of hint, not hint at, but like make it so that everybody's voice is the same, so that everybody has the same platform. Um, so this was, yeah, it was all about giving people equal voice. So somebody who is a polytheistic pagan, for instance, you know, will have the same sort of video as, you know, your run of the mill Christian, you know, it, 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 it's about, it's about giving everybody an equal voice in that respect. Um, so as far as organization, I don't know as if I would have a specific way of saying, you know, I think the way we did it, um, as far as organization goes, is we, um, we sort of flipped the, the, the process a little bit in that, like, I think Ravel and Ravel is traditionally, you know, encouraging people to upload videos themselves, mm -hmm. and that's great, and I think, you know, that can work for so many instances. I think for this university setting, um, we sort of, yeah, we flipped the script and we made a sign-up sheet so that people could actually, you know, de designate their own time. And then we found that that actually worked really well for us. That might not work for everybody else. So, but you know, it, it, it was just, it was key in participation on our part. So um, as far as organization goes, we didn't have it organized in a specific way. Um, so it just, uh, we, but we wanted to make sure that it was an equal playing field for all. So everybody's voice got heard no matter, you know, what their background was. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Todd. And Erin, um, how did you spread the word about this campaign on, on your, um, in your department? Okay, so promotion. I actually think that going off of some of the things that Katie had said about perceptions of the community, that was something that we were really cognizant of. So when we sat down to think about how to promote it, we really kept that in mind. And actually one of the things that Katie and I did really, really early on was we essentially went through all of the university um, majors or departments. We looked at other academic units, and then we also looked at and identified various cultural organizations or student groups, things like that. And we made this huge list. And of all of the people that we thought would somehow be interested in participating or further spreading the word about Ravel and Ravel. And then based on direct relationships that we already had established within those units or departments, Katie and I decided who was going to reach out to them. So I work a lot with different majors through our liaison librarians, and so if there were specific folks in religious studies or history or sociology that I knew, and Katie could definitely say the same with religious studies. 
And then other campus units like the Office of Multicultural Affairs, those, those folks, we essentially used the templates that Ravel and Ravel provided in terms of promotional materials, which were fantastic, and then created kind of scripts for emails that then, that actually made it a lot easier, at least on my part, to then kind of shoot out all of these various communications throughout the semester with these different groups on campus. And then, Todd already mentioned this, but I will reiterate that for us, the sign-up sheet that we created in terms of promotion, actually um, transferring to participation was absolutely key mm -hmm. because it was largely the people who had signed up on this sign-up sheet that we just made in a Google spreadsheet. Those were the people that ended up showing up and participating. I think that a lot of people that we just mentioned it to casually that didn't commit by putting their name on a sign-up sheet, those folks didn't end up showing up. Yeah, I think I, I just want to tack on to that really quick. I think this the model that we used in a use in a university setting could be you know really beneficial. It might not work for you know another smaller campaign, but I think in a use in a in a university setting, this is a really good way to go about it. We saw a lot of you know a lot of positive things and a lot of turnout coming out of you know this model and the sign up sheet and then sort of structuring structuring it a bit more than you know the normal so no it's good good to hear um katie was there anything else in addition that you at the kaufman interfaith institute did to spread the word mm -hmm. um well something that we did It was a balance between the big picture, like getting the word out there that this is a thing that's happy. Um, we shared with other nonprofits statewide, actually, that were really excited about what we were doing. Um, it just really existed, like Center for Inquiry Michigan um, is one organization that thought it was a great idea um, and was really excited to see the videos when they came out. And so I think the awareness about like, making people aware that like this is a project that's going on and this is something that everyone, even if you're not, you know, part of the university and you can't come and do a video, you should um, be aware that, like, this is a conversation that's happening. And so that was one kind of um, promotion that we continue to do and tell people about. Um, but to go back to something that Aaron said, I think the personal outreach was the biggest thing. Um, like, you can put, like, an ad in the paper or posters up or whatever and ads online, but... Um, it was the people that we personally talked to, especially, I mean, religion is like a tough thing to sell to people. Like, you should come talk about your religion with <laughs> people you don't know, and then we're going to put it online. <laughs> like, that's an intimidating thing. So it was after we had kind of like one-on-one -on -one conversation and kind of, I, I got to explain like, actually, this is what it's all about. And after we had those conversations, a lot of the people came. Um, and then uh, there were like one example is that the interfaith student council um, with representatives from each of the faith based groups, they actually planned one of their meetings around one of our filming dates. So they had a, everyone was encouraged to go upstairs and film their Ravel and Ravel video. So it was kind of like planning things like that that really helped get um, more videos from people. That's fantastic. It sounds like you guys had a lot of support going into this. Um, I think I'll add just one other thing. I think that given the amount of support and the amount of effort that we put into it throughout, so we did our campaign in March of 2014. We started promoting in late January, I think. And we did three different kind of publicity pushes, an initial kind of awareness email and then we publicized the specific dates and locations when we'd be filming. And then one follow-up, because we filmed right after students got back on campus from spring break, mm -hmm. one follow-up email just to say one final time, hey, this is happening. And I think because we were really strategic in who we reached out to, that's why you see the diversity of voices that our campaign has. And that was something that we really, really wanted to achieve. I'm glad that we were able to do that. Fantastic. We guys, um, Todd, what was the response like? How many video interviews did you collect? And um, it, can I clarify that? Is that the response in the videos or just the response from the entire campaign? I think both. 
Okay. Um, so I, just talking about the videos themselves, I was maybe, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but I was really, really pleased to see that so many people were um, able to speak about such a personal thing. And the fact that, you know, we had, you know, a lot more uh, diverse opinions and positions than, you know, somebody at Grand Valley might think. So I was really pleased with that. So one, I mean, I remember one day specifically, we had a lot of people who didn't claim a faith tradition um, just right in a row. And it, like <laughs> nobody planned it. It didn't, you know, like we didn't organize it like that. They're just like, it just happened like that. It was organic. And it was really neat to see that, you know, to see that sort of, well, oh, this is, this is somewhere where, you know, it's a safe place. I can actually say these things. So, you know, it was really cool to see that happen. Um, as far as like feedback from the, the videos themselves, I, I don't know. I, one thing that comes to mind is that like, as soon as I put them up, I had, you know, one person I know, um, I saw on Twitter, like in their Twitter bio is a link to their Ravel and Ravel video. Oh, that's great. So it's, yeah, it's like people, people are really sort of emboldened by it and they're encouraged by it. So they're now they're ready to like share this and be like, Hey, this is something really personal about me, but I'd love to share it with you. So I think in that respect, it's been a really, really great, um, opportunity, uh, just to hear that, just to hear that feedback and just to see, you know, people who are like, they're really proud of this. They're really proud of like who they are and you know where they come from. And I was just really glad to be that platform for them, you know? That's fantastic. Um, and did you mention, I'm sorry, did you mention the number? I mean, how many videos did you guys get in total? I believe, is it 37? Does that sound right, guys? 37. 37. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, man. I rounded it up to 40 in my mind. <laughs> you were close. You were close. I mean, I almost will, 40. Almost 40. I will say, I will say that, um, though it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a direct goal of ours. We really, like, we saw how many, like, somebody had this many videos. Like, they had the most, and we're like, we want to beat that number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just wanted, I don't know, it was, it was just a kind of a, offshoot goal of ours like we really well, want to see a lot of coverage yes yeah we, we pulled it off in the last like 10 minutes <laughs> we, were at, like, we were at 35 and there was like there was 10 minutes left before we were done filming and then um dang, we're so close we're so close to like beating the record or like tying with the record and um then we, we pulled it off except now um someone that we had met last year and i had met last week at a conference um in school, I think had a few more videos. Yeah. Than that, which uh, you guys have <laughs> round two of your campaign, then you can get a right. little more. <laughs> that is a really interesting thing to mention or to notice is that because the numbers are public, the unintentional kind of goal setting, and that's actually a very intentional part of setting up your campaign, right? To set a goal of how many yeah. videos you'd like to make. Mm -hmm. So we are proof that setting that number encourages <laughs> greater participation. Yeah. <laughs> You're a great job. Um, well, Erin, I also wanted to, I want to talk to each of you about what is, what was the most rewarding aspect of your experience running the Ravel and Ravel campaign and what was the most challenging? So we'll ask Erin first. Okay. So, so many things were really, really rewarding about this. I have actually told people since March that this was one of the most rewarding activities that I coordinated since starting my position. So I think that what was so rewarding specifically to me was just hearing everyone's responses. One of the really great things for us is that we were there all five days that we filmed. So we got to hear all 37 of of the responses okay. and one of the things that I've actually encouraged people to do once our videos got uploaded and I started sharing the link to the campaign I told people to watch them to watch numerous videos in succession not necessarily to watch all of them I didn't specify particular videos mm -hmm. I just said watch more than one in a row because that's I think when it started to get really amazing for me mm -hmm. is to hear you know one person say something really profound and then five minutes later, somebody else said something really profound. And 
and that continued, you know, for hours at a time because we were filming for about two hour chunks each day. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, you know, the whole idea of Ravel and Ravel is that religion was part of everyone's identity. And so no matter what your specific background or interests are, when you are privy to those sorts of typically more private conversations, it's really eye-opening, it's really inspiring. And again, you know, the whole, the, the interfaith, um, the, the ways that we were able to capture a variety of stories from different faith backgrounds, that was really fantastic too. And then, do I have any challenges? I actually didn't didn't write any down. Let's see if I can think of any off the top of my head. I think for us, there were just some logistical challenges. So because we record, we filmed and recorded these interviews at specific dates and times in different locations on campus for four or five consecutive days, that just, and there were four people involved, so two videographers and then Katie and myself. Logistically, we had to make sure that everyone's schedules worked and that, you know, we were all around to set the equipment up and to be ready and that sort of thing. And we moved between locations in the library and locations in our student union. So that, I think, was one of the really good things about our campaign because of elements that Todd mentioned, like this consistent setting. But it also meant that we all had to be, um, we all had to dedicate a lot of time that week to making it happen. Absolutely. And Katie, how about you? What were the most rewarding and challenging aspects of this campaign for you? Um, I agree with, um, it, it was just really great to hear so many incredible stories and a lot of stories that we wouldn't have been able to hear any other way. And I think that, um, I mean, we've said this a couple times, but we were just really surprised by how insightful everyone was about their traditions. Um, because, like, really, you know, if, if you just say, like, oh, hey, I'm Katie and I'm an atheist, or, like, I'm, like, I'm a Christian or whatever, you have assumptions right away, and you don't think about, like, the deeper meaning of what that identity is, um, and so hearing everyone kind of have the follow-up to, like, explain that identity was just really great, and, I mean, my role during the filming process was to kind of talk to people beforehand, um, you like to process um, and just make them kind of feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. like, going in front of a camera and, you know, saying something that maybe they've never said to their family before or something like that. Um, so just kind of connecting with people, um, connecting with strangers <laughs> in that way, um, who were no longer strangers to me after that, um, was really, really great. And, um, yeah, I, I think that there were a lot of people that were able to provide stories and kind of more of a narrative to put in our valley. Um, so now we're, we're going back and looking at that and using it as like, oh, do you want to know like what it's like to be a student at Grand Valley and like be a part of the interfaith community? Like, listen to these couple stories and you'll kind of get a feel for, for who's involved. Um, and as far as challenges go, um, I mean, I think it was like so re rewarding that the challenges seem pretty minor in our um, <laughs> In scale, but I think that yeah, it was just it was pretty time consuming to do the outreach and to mm -hmm. always kind of be promoting it personally to people mm -hmm. and always having it, um, always bringing it up to, to different groups for classes or things like that. Um, getting the diversity there was something that was really important to us, and <laughs> we didn't want to necessarily, you know, like force Jewish students to come talk about their identity, but we kind of, kind of had to because we're like, well, you know, we can't have you know, 40 videos or whatever and just not have like, Judaism represented. Like, that's a big part of our campus. So ensuring that the diversity was there um, was probably the most time-consuming aspect. But now it's, we're very thankful that, you know, that we spend the time to do that. Fantastic. And Todd, how about for you, what were the most rewarding and challenging aspects of this on your end? I think... Um, I'll start with challenges first, um, but I think the most, one of the most challenging things for me on my end was, I think, 
paying special attention to what people said and making sure that everybody did have the same voice. Um, so I wanted to, so the reason I made, I structured the videos the way that I did is so that like it was a, it was a plain format for everybody you know, it was structured in the same way so that everybody, you know, had that same platform. But I, it was really challenging because I wanted to make sure that like, you know, a Christian would have the same voice as a Muslim mm -hmm. or, you know, it, so these are very, very personal things to people, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and I wanted, I didn't want to tread on that. I, I wanted to respect people's faith and their personal opinion. So, I mean, there were conversations that we've had, you know, we had about, you know, some things that like people, people raise things and we're like, oh, that could be interpreted Oh, I did. Okay. And then we just like, we had to let it go. Cause it's not our, you know, mm -hmm. that's not our thing. You know, this is their opinion. This is their worldview. So it's it, to respect that, um, you know, and to make sure that their voice was heard was pretty challenging. And then obviously like setting up and making sure everything looked okay. And, you know, just shooting the thing was, you know, stressful, but it was like, yeah, it was rewarding. It was, I think one of the most rewarding aspects for me is the fact that we've had, we had a couple of times during the filming where somebody said, this is the first time I've said this out loud. This is the first time I've sort of, you know, like said this to anybody else. Like I've believed this for so long, you know, this is the way I felt, but it's not until now that I've actually said it to other people. So we're like, well, okay, get in front of the camera. Let's do it. <laughs> um, Fantastic. So that was really, that was really great to, to, to be of service to people like that. So give them that platform, I think, is the best thing for me. Um, and so, Todd, what are, you, what are you taking away from this experience? Um, what do you think those who involvement? Um, well, I hope, I hope that they got the idea that um, no matter what your background is, no matter what your personal faith is, it's okay to talk about it, and it's okay to share that with people, um, and, and to not be ashamed of who you are and what you believe, but you know, to, to be a little more proud of it. So when I saw somebody who had that link in their Twitter profile, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's really cool, because they're take, they're kind of taking that to heart. It's like they, you know, they were sort of emboldened by the experience. You know, which is, you know, what I hoped for. Um, so what I personally got out of it was just, um, I don't know, a, a lot of respect for people, I think. You know, just respect for them to, to get up and do that. So I, like, I initially didn't want to do it myself. <laughs> you know, I ended up and did it, but <laughs> it was, you know, it, it was after, it wasn't until after I saw a couple other people do it, be so brave and so bold, you know, to share that really personal thing, so... Um, just really a respect for people and respect for their openness and their ability to be, um, to share that with us. I think that's what I got out of it. Fantastic. Uh, Katie, how about you? Um, what are you taking away from this experience and what are you, what do you think or what do you hope that the participants took away as well? doing interface um, on the, in this community, it was really inspiring or motivating for me to see that these conversations that I want to be having all the time are actually things that other people want to talk about too, and they're really invested in these um, issues too. I think it's just that there wasn't an opportunity before for, the, mm -hmm. for them to have these conversations, and so that was really encouraging that it's not just my own little world that I'm living in where interfaith matters. <laughs> but really, I think people um, are realizing that having these conversations and listening to others um, and their perspectives is becoming more and more important. Um, and I think that's what I would really love um, for people to get out of it is not just voicing their own um, identity, but kind of taking that next step and like watching the other videos seeing their own video in the context of all of the, the rest of the campaign and seeing that um, listening to the other voices and stories and identities and having them, um, I think, you know, even just literally being on the same platform as being on a video, being in the same structure and seeing that um, 
they're all on the same. It's, it's like pretty cheesy, but that, you know, people from every background, we're all the same when it gets down to it. Like we all have the same um, interest in sharing our own identities. And so I think that was something that everyone was like, oh, <laughs> um, and in general, I think that the model that Ravel and Ravel provided with those four questions is something that we want to use to continue a dialogue beyond this series. That's fantastic. Um, and Erin, um, what are you taking away and what are you hoping others are taking away as well? I think the things that I was, I think the things that Katie and Todd said probably summarize the same things that I was thinking about. So I guess just to reiterate, you know, I hope that people took away that they, you know, were inspired and kind of felt empowered by being able to participate in a conversation that's very personal in a way that they hadn't been able to participate before. So this kind of synchronous, asynchronous capability that Ravel and Ravel provides. I hope that that was, you know, that that provided new insights or inspiration, which it sounds like from those that we did hear from, that that definitely was their experience, but hopefully for everyone on some level. They All right. Um, and I want to ask you all one last question, um, but just to, and then we will open it up to see if any of the other participants have uh, questions um, or seeking any advice for their own campaigns. Um, but just a reminder again, you can tweet any questions to us at Project Interface on Twitter. Um, Katie, we will start with you. What advice, tips, or suggestions would you have for anyone else hoping to start a campaign? Um, and why do you think this is a valuable tool overall to use? I think the, um, the biggest thing that worked out really well for our campaign that I wasn't really expecting when I first started visualizing what it would look like at Grand Valley um, was partnering with the library. Mm. Because I wouldn't have, <laughs> if we hadn't have sat at the same table at the Twali event, um, <laughs> I wouldn't have known about this learning outcome and kind of the goals of the library to be an interdisciplinary and be kind of a place where students from across campus where their voices are, are heard and represented. So I would encourage um, if anyone is in that, in the same boat as me and being in an interfaith organization, um, I mean, it's pretty likely if you were, are working for an interfaith organization that there are very few of you and that you don't have a lot of, like, human power um, and resources to put behind it. And so finding, um, finding those unlikely or likely allies that are invested in the same ideas as you, um, I think just made the process, uh, I mean, it was a lot more fun <laughs> than if I would have done it, um, tried to do something like this on my own. And it, the product, I think the quality of it totally came from having um, you know, for people working on this project really closely and having everyone's perspectives on like how to make this the best possible project. I mean, really making it a collaborative process um, as much as possible would be the biggest, um, biggest tip that I have for people. And Todd, how about you? What um, advice or pain um, and why do you think this is a valuable tool? Um, what's interesting, well, yeah, I, I really like what Katie said, but I think conversation and collaboration is key. So as much as this is a campaign about interfaith dialogue, this needs to be a dialogue to make this. So you should be talking. You should be talking to other people on campus. You should be, you know, if you don't have film resources, reach out to your film department. Reach out, like, start reaching out to people and saying, hey, this is something that we really want to do. Do you want to help us with this? Do you want to partner with it? Because then that sort of fosters this um, well, it you know it's intercultural and it sort of it, it brings people together in some like around a, a central goal, you know, like interface dialogue, and I think that's really important. So why you know why do a interface dialogue without any cooperation or you know collaboration from other people? You know, yeah. I think it's it's really really important to talk to other people, um, and then with the with the the videos themselves like if you're gonna do it in the same format or or in a similar format uh, that we did like make sure that you pay special attention to 
um, everybody's stories and make sure that they're represented fairly and equally. Um, it, I mean, we even had a half hour, 45 minute conversation about music and whether or not we we're going to include music because we didn't want to cheapen what people were saying. So it's like, it's be really diligent about creating that fair and equal platform for people. Great. And Aaron, how about you? What advice or tips or suggestions would you have? And then why do you think this is a valuable tool? Okay, so a few additional tips. First, thank you, Todd, for mentioning music. Um, <laughs> I think that that's one thing that a really, really good example of probably one of the things that distinguishes our videos. But it's true that even down to those choices, down to you know designing the transitions where the questions are, we had conversations about all of those things. And when we did have those conversations, we're constantly thinking about how they would contribute to or detract from the larger goal of representing people's voices accurately and you know, sticking with the original goals of fostering interfaith dialogue. So um, knowing that other groups besides academic institutions often host Ravel and Ravel campaigns, we've made a lot of academic references, but just to reiterate as a tip, I think because faith and non-faith identities resonate with anyone, it is actually really easy to find experts who can collaborate with you that have a variety of skills. And again, this is kind of building off what Todd's already said, but if you know, you're know you an interfaith organization, ask around if someone has a little bit of video editing skills, or if they have a nice camera that you might be able to borrow. Because I think that those things are easier to come by than you might expect if you just start asking around. Mm -hmm. And then my other tip, one of the things that came up for us midway through running our campaign is a conversation about how to keep these videos alive after the campaign was over. And there were a number of events mm -hmm. that Katie ran where actually she integrated a number of videos and really, really fantastic dialogue came out of those. And we've continued, I think, to brainstorm about how we can integrate them in other ways into live and online programs that we're running. Because I think we saw such amazing things come out of it and we didn't want them, although they serve an amazing broader purpose on the Ravel and Ravel website, we wanted to keep the awareness of locally within the Grand Valley community, I think, um, thriving so that we could continue to see the benefits of the dialogue grow. Fantastic. Um. And with that, I just wanted to open it up to see if anyone here has any questions um, or is seeking any additional advice if you're interested in starting a campaign. Um, so that's sort of the big challenge I think that I'm facing. 
Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, especially if you have, you have a little bit of background in film and video, I think you, you, you sort of, you know what looks good and what, you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, so I think it's not, it's not a bad thing to set some sort of parameters for people. So you, it could even be like, okay, just make sure you're at a blank wall or, you know, maybe if you don't want to do that, you know, make sure there's not a lot of background noise, just like, just little things like that. Make sure that they can be as consistent as possible and that their message gets through. It's, I think one of the most difficult things for us is we didn't want, you know, people to be walking by or, you know, something so much that it was distracting. So there could be a little, I mean, there was one day where we had people, you know, walking on the outside, but I don't think it was detracting from what people were saying, you know, so make sure you can set a couple of parameters that just, you know, ensure that I don't think, and I actually, I think that's a really cool idea that you're going to do it for, you know, so many different, you know, that's, that's something that we didn't get to do. So if you're going to have, you know, 140 different locations, then that's great. That's awesome. That's even better. But yeah, you could, there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, you know, and it, it can be on an iPhone. It can be, you know, like that's totally okay. It's just, as long as the message is clear and what people are saying is what, you know, it, it, it rings true. It rings, it rings through what they're saying, you know, no matter what their environment is. So just making, taking steps to say this, 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 you'd really prefer if you had it this way. And then, you know, I don't know, that, that would be my advice on the technical aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm going to jump as well, um, with people who are coming together at a workshop that I hadn't met. So I sent out a mass email. What I did first was actually, um, recorded my own video interview. Um, and so I, I did it on my, my Mac with my iPhoto. Um, so I uploaded my own video interview, and then I I sent an email out kind of explaining what it is and why I wanted to do this, and then I listed really, like, step by step what people had to do to try to make it as easy as possible, um, and so, I, which I'd be happy to share with you, but, um, yeah. you know, just kind of going through it myself again was helpful, where I was like, okay, you know, do your video, and I tried to reiterate, like Todd said, you can do this on a, a smartphone, you can do this on your webcam or a video camera, um, and then upload the video, so, you know, click here to upload your video, this is the information you're going to have to input, you know, this is the information that's actually going to show up on the website, don't forget to use this campaign tag, so I tried to be really, really deliberate about, like, every single step, um, so that people hopefully felt comfortable and were able to do it, um, and then, you know, letting them know as well, like, if you have any technical issues, I know not everybody's super tech savvy, like, if you have any issues, like, let me know, and we can arrange this. And maybe, um, giving them an opportunity to, or if they really can't upload the video beforehand, maybe having an opportunity to collect videos at the actual gathering when you guys are together as well. So. Yeah, I, oh, sorry. Sorry, um, I was just going to say, maybe make a model video, and just, you yeah. know, check this out, and then go from there. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, I plan to upload my own video within the next day or two so that I can include that. Um, and we were also good, I'm also going to bring my camera to our national orientation because we know that there's other people too who are like working at camps throughout the summer mm -hmm. and aren't, just really aren't going to have the time to sit down and do it or have the technology necessarily available to sit down and play with. So, um, But we do want to get as many started before our national orientation. Mm -hmm. Get, you know, so that people can kind of discover each other before they come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Sierra, uh, Sierra, I definitely want that. We'll do <laughs> that. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't know how helpful this is, but in some of the reading that I've done of kind of participatory experiences in museums specifically, one thing that was really surprising to me is that they've said that with things like that. Oftentimes, cultural institutions think that that participants are empowered by having no parameters set on their participation, but actually research shows that people really like to essentially be given specific directives. So it sounds like with what Sierra was mentioning, that that's really helpful to decrease anxiety of participation, where you say, you know, here's an example video. These are the steps to follow. <laughs> Don't worry if 
You've never done this before. Um, are there any other questions or else I really would like to open it up for just some final thoughts um, and then we can wrap up. All right. I will start with you, Katie. Final thoughts or comments? Advice? <laughs> um, I think one of the things that um, Aaron kind of mentioned this at the end in how um, how this project was able to, I think, strengthen the other interface projects that were going on, and then in return, I think the other interface projects that were going on really helped this project. Um, the timing worked out really well for us because um, I don't know if everyone is familiar with Interface Youth Core and their Better Together project um, or Better Together campaign. Um, and every year they have a Better Together Day. And so they have a pledge that you're supposed to sign to say, like, hey, we want to be loved and the voices of intolerance. Um, and that, can't, that um, pledge actually came out right before our campaign started. So that was a really nice way of kind of giving an introduction to people, like, hey, so this is like this is another thing that's going on um, with the same idea. And I think putting it into the context of the greater interfaith movement was really helpful for people because they saw that um, this isn't just something that this video series is doing, this is something that um, everyone can be continually involved in. Um, and then we ended up getting enough people to sign the pledge uh, through that process that we got a few free registrations for an interface use core conference. Yes. Um, and then we also used the videos on the Better Together Day event that we had as a way of starting conversations with people. Where someone, you know, afterwards came up to me and was like, so you're an atheist? <laughs> like, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, and like, I mean, I'm not going to go out and say, like, I'm an atheist to people, but after they watch the video, I kind of realized that, like, oh, I've known you for a while, and that surprises me, and I'm like, really? Okay, and so that's just a good place to start a conversation. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that uh, the value in this is that it can really build a lot of um, power and momentum for, um, for anything else that you're already doing with your faith on a campus or in a community. Fantastic. Um, Todd, how about you? Final thoughts? Final thoughts. Um, well, first, just thanks for this opportunity. Um, I, it was it was it was a pleasure doing this Ravel Unravel campaign. Um, and like I said before, it was really great to um, to experience this interfaith dialogue. So I, you know, I'm a religious studies minor. So I've you know I've dabbled in that. You know, and I experienced that a little bit. But to sort of dive head first into this this project that really focuses on you know interfaith and intercultural uh, dialogue was it was really it was really something special and it's something that you know in my four years at Grand Valley like I'm really proud to have done you know I've done a lot of things over the course of my four years but this was this is a really standout thing this is really uh, something that I think I can be proud of um, something that I've done that like really is significant in some way that you know that's greater than myself so i i was just glad to be a part of it so. Fantastic. and aaron we will um end with you any final thoughts or comments i will second todd in telling you thank you for the opportunity one of the things that happened throughout the spring semester as we were preparing for this is that todd and katie had to listen to me actually talk about my own faith <laughs> and so you know we talked about all of the benefits for students and others that participated but for me personally it was actually something that I was kind of thinking about and struggling with for the past couple of years so for me it was so it was really really beneficial on a personal level to get to participate so thanks for that and I, I definitely think it's such a worthwhile opportunity Anyone who's considering it should definitely do so. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. We hope that this was helpful to anyone interested in starting a campaign. Um, again, please check out the GVSU Kaufman campaign. It's fantastic. The videos are beautiful, um, and there's just some great stories on there. So thank you all so much, um, and we will be doing 
a Google Hangout in October as well. We'll be um, we'll be sharing information about that soon with uh, multiple organizations that have done campaigns to kind of look at the different ways to do it and the different perspectives. So thank you all so much. Thank you.